Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you here with us tonight for our last Walking with Whitman of 2020. Uh, this was season 10 of Walking with Whitman, and George Wallace has been our writer in residence for 10 years, bringing us these wonderful poets, um, international poets and local poets. And tonight we have Edgar Carlson with us, and then we have a wonderful community mic of poets, um, and musician Linda Sussman is with us as well. Yeah, come back on here. All right. And these events, I mean, they've grown so tremendously, even on Zoom, or even especially on Zoom, they've grown so much uh, because we're getting so many new people, new faces, um, and of course, our wonderful community from uh, the birthplace in Huntington, New York, where our museum is located. So we're just so happy that we can share this. It's always a very inspiring night, creative night um, for everyone. So thank you for being here. And we're gonna start tonight with our first song from Linda Sussman. And I'm just gonna read to you about Linda and then we'll go right to her. Linda Sussman is a Long Island, New York based recording artist whose music blurs the lines of contemporary folk and blues. Linda's music has received international airplay from New York stations WFUV and WUSB to other parts of the US, UK, Europe, Israel and elsewhere. And her 2019 album titled Pass It, Down, Pass it On Down has landed on the RMR's Best in Contemporary Folk chart for both 2019 and 2020. Pre-pandemic, Linda was touring the East Coast as a solo artist and at times performing with her studio musicians under the name The Linda Sussman Collective, including gigs at New York City's iconic The Bitter End. Her upcoming album, These Walls, will be released in early 2021. Linda Sussman's music is available across all streaming sites and you can get more information on her website, which I'm gonna put in our chat. And again, everyone, just remember, you could always write in our chat. Um, I'm gonna make sure that all these comments get to our poets and our musician right with us tonight. All right, Linda, it's so wonderful to welcome you back. I'm gonna give you the spotlight right now. Well, thank you, Caitlin. I'm really happy to be here um, once again and adding my music. This is just a wonderful event that you do, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all the poets. And um, so I'll just kick things off with a song, a song of mine called Tomorrow Blues.
As always, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll be hearing more from Linda later on in the program. She's going to come back for a musical interlude and then at the end of the program as well. All right. So I always want to start off our programs by saying thank you so much to everyone who donates. You make programs like this possible. Uh, we celebrated Giving Tuesday this week. Um, if you know of it, it's a international day of giving. Um, especially towards programs and places that give towards the community. And our community has just grown wildly over these past few months because we were able to make these programs virtual. Um, and if you, even if you look at our chat, you can see there's just so many people here that couldn't even fit really in our interpretive center. I don't think we have enough chairs for the people. So we're just so excited that we've been able to grow uh, this much and also just expand the learning about Whitman um, expand, you know, the poets that we're able to invite, the poets that we're able to share. Um, so if you are able to donate in any amount, it's so appreciated. Even if it's something small, like $5 that you would normally spend on Starbucks, to us it means so much as we continue to grow these programs and we continue to plan more programs that incorporate history and poetry. So thank you so much for any amount of donation. We really appreciate it. Um, and also we appreciate you being here tonight and we appreciate uh, everyone who follows our social media, is on our email list. Um, we're doing so much to try to share more Whitman knowledge with many people, as many people as we can. So, um, and always, of course, you can always comment. I'm sort of running all these things. So I love also, we get so many nice messages from everyone, sort of a big uh, Whitman family that we've grown here. So thank you for that too. All right, and I want to tell you about one upcoming event that we have, and then we'll be able to get started. On December 16th, which is a Wednesday, um, we're going to have uh, Library of Congress historian and curator Barbara Baer with us. And she's going to be talking about the Library of Congress um, program called By the People, which is an online um, public program where you can go through Whitman's handwritten documents and help transcribe them. Um, so basically you, you can sit at your computer and you can go through all these documents that have not yet been transcribed because they're very difficult to read. And you'll see what I mean if you look this up. Um, Whitman writes these ideas down very quickly and you'll even see there's a lot of ink splotches on the page, which I heard is very unusual for the uh, type of pen that they had at that time. And it's just because he's such a passionate person so you actually feel like you're learning about Whitman while you're reading all these little ideas for poems he's writing down and things like that. So she'll be with us to talk about the program and to talk about how you could help transcribe uh, all of these poems. So that's gonna be December 16th. And again, if you're following us, you'll be able to um, find that event and sign up for it just the way you did uh, for tonight's event. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to get started. And we have George Wallace with us who again has been um, created this program 10 years ago and has been facilitating it for all that time. And he's brought us so many amazing international and local poets um, for all these years. And we're so happy to have him with us virtually now too. And George, oh, and I want to mention too, on our YouTube, we have a reading with George uh, that took place a few months ago. So if you want to look that up, it's definitely an amazing thing. So Take a look for that. You can look up George Wallace, Walt Women Birthplace, and you'll find it. All right, George, I'm handing you the spotlight now. All right. Thank you, Caitlin. As always, Caitlin and Cynthia Short are doing a fantastic job for us. All of you who've been involved in the uh, uh, performance or, or production of poetry at the Walt Women Birthplace the past 10, 15 years or so have seen how it's evolved and grown <coughs> remarkably during their tenure. I mean, Caitlin's kind of new. Cynthia's been around over a, over a dozen years. When I say 10 or 15 years, that's how quickly this time passes. Because I've been a poet writer in residence since 2011, so going on the 10th year of doing this. So the time goes quickly, but I, we've seen the, the commitment that um, 
steadfast commitment they've had towards um, <laughs> towards uh, bringing poetry. The actual poetry is one of the components of what what women is <laughs> as a, as a, as a something to interpret and to celebrate uh, to the public. You know, there was a time when the House of the What Women Birthplace Association was 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 juggling what they were what they thought was important to do, maintain that building. That in itself being a major task. You know, um, if, uh, interpreting and promoting Walt Whitman's legacy, the I mean, network extending networks and relationships with other institutions in order to solidify its position as an institution. But the one thing that, that there's always one of the maybe that's maybe this, this, uh, the fifth wheel in the at the birthplace was performing poetry and service to the poetry community on Long Island. National poets for years now, and I just want to one more time. Every time, really, I want to thank them for doing that and, um, <clears throat> and let you all know that um, this is not an automatic thing for, the, for this to happen on, the, on Long Island, to have a, um, an institution that's filling this particular ecological niche in, um, in, uh, in poetry, connecting local and, uh, and, local and national and international poets, poets together. So uh, it's a great, great work you're doing. Keep up the fine work, Kate. <clears throat> I've been involved in the Long Island poetry scene for since 1988, and um, when uh, there was maybe two poetry readings on Long Island, regular poetry readings on Long Island, and uh, there was that uh, small pockets of poets out in, out east in the Hamptons, Huntington uh, Long Island Poetry Collective, and very small pockets at uh, in, uh, universities, Stony Brook and um, uh, CW Post and, and Hofstra, but uh, it was not uh, what uh, we now see. 40 years on, nearly 40 years on, you know, a community of writers, you know, as diverse as we have, as broad as we have, and the, the sheer numbers and the quality of, of the writers that we have in the Long Island writing community. And so in recent years, as we've been doing this um, Walking with Whitman series, we've we discovered it was a good idea to have, to have a, just a real open mic night for, for somebody special from among us, the hundreds of people who, um, who were performing or writing poetry on the island um, and, uh, and, and, and showcase their work. Not just as the, like the second to some international star comes in, which is great in itself, but to be able to do that as the, the number one person reading. And that's what we have before us today. We do this twice a year with the Walking with Whitman series, and I think it's worked well. I'm particularly glad today to be able to, uh, to introduce um, Edgar Carlson to you, not that, um, any of you are not familiar with it. Any, any of you are familiar with the, with the Long Island poetry scene? Well, know Edgar's work quite well. Many of you do not. And those of you outside of our area, <clears throat> you're in for a treat today because you're going to hear some work that uh, is really going to surprise you for the quality, the depth, and the strength, and the power, the sheer raw power of uh, of the way that he wrestles words into existence and turns them into to poems. is is just a wonderful experience. You know, there's um uh. uh as you might imagine, there's 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 people writing poetry uh, on Long Island who are from uh, you know university setting. There's people that are from a suburban setting. There's people that are from uh, <clears throat> you know a a, um, a a very wealthy setting and 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 working class poets as well, and uh, very fine working class poets. And whatever Edgar's background is, you know, economically or his his family background, as a person who presents himself as a landscaper. And a person who presents himself as a taxi cab driver, Uber driver, you know, that's not just a, that's just not a pose. This is a man who really works the soil. I've seen him do it right here in my house with a, with a you know, with, 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 with gardening equipment. He can take down a tree very quickly, very expertly. He's one of four, I think that we've got four people on the round who, were, who over the years have established themselves <coughs> as landscaper poets. He's shown them with their own particular approach to, uh, to um, their connection to the land. Edgar has his own, and it is really quite visceral his connection to, to, to words as it is to to the, the rocks and the and the and the roots of, of the earth. Uh, we are all indebted in, on Long Island to the work of uh, Maxwell Wheat, poet uh, who was a, who was a leader for many years and. And talking about the sense of place and the 
and uh, that we have a unique capacity to explore and express a, a sense of space here on Long Island. You know, the um, from the Hempstead Plains to the the uh, the, the Pine Barrens and the, the sea coasts and the and the long long dunes of uh, of the barrier beaches. We have a unique thing to to bring to people's attention so that they understand that Long Island is much more than um, than <clears throat> And you know, a couple of hundred miles with uh, Levittown houses sprinkled across it like Monopoly houses. This is a, an amazing place. And when you hear you know, the, the poets of Long Island who do speak to this sense of place, you hear the magic in it. And Edgar's is a specific kind and a remarkable kind of magic. His understanding of the grid. And when when you read a read or listen to an Edgar Crossan poem, you're going to be wading knee deep into the mud and the thick of it. That's what you couldn't experience. So I don't want to take any more of his time because it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing to hear. I'm glad to be able to introduce Edgar Crossan to all of you today. So please welcome to the Wall of Birthplaces, Walking with Whitman series, Edgar Carlson. Thank you, George. Um, am I audible? Yes, you're all set. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to read a quick poem because uh, there was, well, when I first got here at 6.30, there was two ladies from bookstore. So, Haiku Wino in the Huntington Book Review, scanning barcodes. And I'd like to thank the uh, Walt Whitman Birthplace Association for uh, setting up tonight's program. And uh, that includes Caitlin Shea, and Cynthia Shaw. And I'd like to thank uh, George Wallace. George Wallace is an on the road poet. You know, he's all over the place. It's not just Long Island. It's not just New York City. In fact, George married New York City to Long Island. Uh, the total part of Long Island, not just the East End being married to New York City, the people that would wander out in the summer uh, historically. But uh, now it's a permanent it's a permanent situation. Long Island poets bounce into Brooklyn and Manhattan, and it's uh, and back and forth. And uh, there's a level of confident of uh, comfortability that did not exist before. And uh, when George is out on the road, he's a good shepherd. And when he's on Long Island, he is the good shepherd of Long Island poetry. And George is my good shepherd. And I'd just like to thank the audience. And uh, I see a lot of people from the Long Island Poetry Collective, and I'm very happy to, to be reading for you tonight. For the blizzard, and in homage to Maxwell, I am reading Snowbound. You shed a white skin, you shed a black skin, you are a new moon, you are a full moon. You are two full moon maples, both fitting into the blue denim of July. In Poland, you were a painted bird. In Poland, we were naked as crocodiles, except the last few days, except our visit to the Carpathian foothills. This is where the train stopped. This is where we listened to each link stopping in a black and white chain. In Herculaneum, our room was full of Icelandic poppies, one yellow and two red in three different places. In Herculaneum, we had five days to talk of three white bodies in the black dust of a brothel. From our pillows, we called one Susie Wong. The other two were the Nubian horsemen, Rufus and Valentine. In Herculaneum, we were a room full of golden rain trees. In Herculaneum, we were a room full of howler monkeys. A cold day with white clouds and sea winds. Toward sunset, a line in the ocean. A cold day with clouds and sea winds. Toward sunset, a line in the ocean. The retiree on another downside of aging. The rigmarole of starting over with new darkness. And this is a form, uh, I was in a class with Evelyn Candell, and the form is called a rondine. It's R-O-N-D-I-N-E. It's 
a lot of rhyme in it, and uh, it's, a, it's a celebrate poem. War letters, sacred ground, Rondine, to my daughter. It would be nice to find a house, a home, to leave the artifacts I have, I hold, familiar items, grandmas, grandpas, gold leaf German Bible, printed in Cologne, mother's Alsatian dolls, pink pearls from Rome, in family hands and hearts. Because I'm old, it would be nice. My parents' letters via chromosome I send to you, my daughter, flock and fold. Unread by me, I've kept my zeal controlled and found. By just leaving them left alone, it will suffice. Um, Judy Torek liked this poem, so I'm including it. It's a haiku. In an icicle, some light gets stuck on its way to a rainbow. And uh, two years ago on the, uh, in the winter, I was with Ed uh, Lohr. We were hunting for uh, seals down in the Great South Bay. Brant's drinking snow melt flushing through a dune entice me to take a taste. Brant's drinking snow melt flushing through a dune entice, entice me to take a taste. Whistling Whitman Sweet Hollow Slam, number one. I write a lot of poem in series, so they get numbered. In the vandalized part of the Bethpage United Methodist Church Cemetery established 1869, there is a tree stump cut just right to accommodate a taller person. I cut it that way for a guy who has a voice here where we, me, myself, I, and nobody are doing a sit down to mull over a glib response to a question posed to a poet at Walt Whitman's birthplace. Poetry is political. No one responded, no one spoke up for poetry, but on my way home, before my truck even got warm, I felt I had let the poet skate. For if poetry is peanut butter and politics is jelly, they might be found linked together in a lunch bag sandwich, but P, B is not J. And uh, this came out of a, Evelyn's class, uh, it's called a, hmm, a Shadama. It's called a Shadama. It's a form. Uh, it could actually be used for contemporary poetry. Um, I just have a poem here. This is a poem. Making fish cakes. I use cod, not fresh, not frozen, bacalao, salted cod, the one that looks like roadkill, flat and mummified. To prepare, I cut it in chunks, then hydrate in the fridge, changing the water three times in 24 hours. Skin side up, these go in a pot of water with onions and carrots to boil half an hour. When it cools, I flake the cooked fish from the skin with a fork. The clean meat is heart and soul of my, fi of my cod fish cakes. Friends will call, say, that's too involved, too messy, you're crazy, that's just too much poetry. Who has time for that? I tell them, I like making things with my hands, carpentry or cuisine, and there's never too much poetry. Uh, the last line comes from something Paula Camacho used to say, uh, you, you, there's always room for one more baby, there's always room for one more poem. Eight fifteen a.m. mid-November. My mother no longer goes to Florida over winter. Everyone I know is gone. Instead, she is raking leaves in a panic of resolve to get her side of the road clean before the Farmingdale leaf removal truck turns around. A few golden leaves blew in overnight. Though she owns no golden trees, her trees are oaks, the worst offender, a pin oak. 
Its fibrous petioles and vascular bundles refuse to break easily at the abscission line. The leaves come down in their own time. Some hang up there into the second month of spring. My mother examines one of last night's immigrants. Her blue eyes caterpillar greenly around its gold edge. She gives the whole leaf a study before she throws it away into a pail, used for junk mail and yard work. No name, no forwarding address. Father is burning leaves, even the yellow ones with red margins. Father is burning leaves, even the yellow ones with red margins. Made it to Jones Beach late on a short day, just right for viewing shadows. In Ed Law's study, what did I see? A small mirror, but big windows. And despite the groundhog's dire forecast, a cardinal is whistling it away. My one cousin uh, associates a cardinal with her grandmother who had passed away last year. And uh, so despite the groundhog's dire forecast, a cardinal is whistling it away. And then just that uh, her grandmother is my uh, aunt. So Montauk Solar Pop Portrait number 44 to Helen Alessio. In late spring, Aunt Helen turned 99. Her father had returned from France in January, 1919. And she was likely conceived that September. And so since this September, though not turned 100, she has been living for 100 years. Her 95th birthday was white glove. The next four were thematic backyard parties. This year at La Fiesta, she gave me an envelope. Auntie, thanks for the poetry from Walt's Corner you set aside for me. You are eight beautiful aunts. You keep me singing. You are my watershed oracle mountain. You are my gold metal chrome solar pop fountain. After the snowstorm, squirrels warmed up to each other's nature. Um, when I started, when I started writing sonnets after originally writing silence, uh, you know, using um, uh, Elizabethan and uh, Stuart um, era type of uh, forms and, uh, you know, even earlier ones. Um, I just erased everything and I started from scratch because I, I found the sonnet form when you try to mimic Shakespeare, it gets to, uh, you start tying yourself in knots and it's uh, difficult. You, it becomes an, it, it, it's a crossword puzzle after a while. So I, here's how I started about a while back. Um, blue plum sonnet. Red rust, red jug, red October, red kite, red rocket, red wheelbarrow, red devil, black dress, red sauce of maidenhair. Blue Danube of roses, blue eyes full of ashes, blue attraction in a red dress. Blue companion in a red garden, blue plum, well hung, red mum, red tide, red tongue. Um, and that freed me up. You know, I started doing the colors. When I went to college, all the paintings were colors. Like uh, this is uh, shade number seven of red. And uh, just, uh, it was very popular in the uh, 60s. Um, color, I don't actually know the name of it, but color art. <laughs> And uh, I guess I had that in my mind. And I went through a lot of colors. I also did, uh, th this is a, from a series on Hadrian. This is toward the end of Hadrian's life. 24 elephants could not pull your fingers apart. 
Your emotions were crazy glue. Your emotions were August 6th, 1945. Your emotions were caravels in an age of discovery. Your emotions drowned in the Nile. Your emotions did not drowned in the Nile. Your emotions are a beaded lizard with one good eye paved in earthquakes. Your emotions are an aftershock with eight more years of bodily sickness. Time spent mostly at Tivoli adding to your villa and gardens. Where the absent Antinous is white bone and monocot rooting in the black loam of your shoreline. Emperor, your resonant memory is, is a temple bell with lovely canals of skin. Emperor, from Tivoli, farmers are vanished and vineyards return to grassland. From Tivoli, fishermen no longer mend their nets and lobster boats sink at their moorings. From Tivoli, doctors are anacondas and Sybil's Mojave jungle. From Tivoli, philosophers are soothsayers. From Tivoli, your generals are bricklayers. During the crisis, I notice some of my gray squirrels are redheads. During COVID, we learned expediency is not policy. And I'm gonna start a series here this one here is like a, it's like a black, I'm starting with this black and white picture. It's not a black and white picture. Or let's say it's Marilyn Monroe on the beach. We've probably all seen it sometimes in our life. It's probably the picture I started with. Montauk Solar Pop Portrait number two. Photographic apartheid, a black and white, a watertight woman, a personal treasure, kneeling in the basalt, owning her own honor and hunger, holding the attention of every cameraman on the shore. And another piss test, and another partial, another piss test for the imagination, a figure red woman sequestered on the seaside of an ancient shard with red beaches, red birds, red bees, with white wavelets rolled around her knees. Um, there's a lot of reference to uh, in this series, uh, uh, it, there's a lot of reference to Venus, to Venus. And this is further on and it has some explanations of some places that I'm going. Montauk solar pop portrait number 19. Montauk, the end, lands end where the sky mile shovel ice ground to a halt, where all that is left of the ancient Glacial geography is rising ocean and rotting cliffs where the War Department secreted big 16 inch naval guns within Camp Hero, where it is rumored the Montauk Project opened a wormhole to the blue lizard planets where we ogled their saurian science and they ogled our entomological plenitude. Terminal Moraine and Alamo Ocean, where it is rumored Zeus tossed his father's manhood into the deep, where it is also rumored Venus came out of the water, fully erect, steady on her feet, hardly drunk at all, a salt tolerant woman, a Parthenon of silken tents, with one foot in the sea foam and, an, and the other already ashore. Body altar, orange eye pop, Sweet hollow end of a straw. And uh, Ed Laws, Ed Laws liked a few things in the next poem. <clears throat> it's also Stephen Farrow comes into this series now. Uh, he's and he's a Montaukit who eventually becomes a chief of the tribe. But before that, he was only chief for a very short time. He's also supposed to be the last full-blooded Montauk, but I would, uh, I, I doubt that that's true. Um, <clears throat> because many people in the tribe went, went west. They first went to the, uh, <clears throat> to the five nations and then they moved further out west. Montauk solar pop portrait number 23. 
where Akabonic tapers down to land bridge, where all that is left of the Paleolithic terrain is a red erratic, a hogshead of stone once buried in an outreach of till, Stephen Farrow on his way to Turtle Hill from Sag Harbor to deliver medicine and a message to Mr. Miller, the head keeper, from Willie, Mr. William Tooker, the new apprentice apothecary, interrupts his mission and indifferent to the scat sits, presently mindful only of the curiosity he discovered back there on a strand. Sand plain, prickly pear, not league creature. Not bug, not bug creature. In promised land, not far from the fish oil works where hungry insects bump into each other as they descend from high heaven to crowd the carcass riding on the beach. Two flies having bathed their tongues and feet in the liquor meat are now looking more seriously at each other. And uh, the uh, reason that I just, um, this poem here, there's a name in here, William uh, Tooker. It's Mr. William Tooker. He's a, a pharmacist in uh, Sag Harbor. And he took photographs of all out east. So he has these uh, silver, you know, silver print uh, photographs of Sag Harbor and the East End when it's, it's barren. You know what I mean? It's, it's pretty barren. Some of his pictures are just landscapes of uh, um, marsh and uh, water, you know, like bay, bay scenes, but the, but the bay scenes are fairly empty. Sometimes there's a boat. In one, there's three swordfish and they're off of uh, Shagwan Point and they're basking in the sun and he, and he has a photograph. So that's why I just, I'm, I'm just mentioning that. Plus try to get a hold of his uh, pictures. You'll find them all fascinating. Yeah, somebody owns them and they've never, they're very tightly held. Um, Montauk Solar Pop Portrait, number 29. And this is now Stephen Farrell. Warren. Montauk Solar Pop Portrait, number 29. His legs are a banged up basket. His legs are a tatted seine. His legs are a fox sniffing the rack where Stephen in his loamings sees three swordfish above and apart from their brethren in the Gulf Stream, basking in Block Island Sound in the shallows off Sh Shagwang. In Petersburg, Southern soldiers drowned in the initial cradle, crater blast. In Petersburg, Northern soldiers drowned in the bungled follow-up attack. In Petersburg, Stephen Farrow stepped in clover. He lived out both battle and war to return to the land he belongs to, a land he needs to feel the certainty that he is alive, which is more than knowing life is potent, the joy of being spared. Number 43, when the numbers do not add up, Lori is telling you exactly that in a brief text on your first date over vanilla lattes at a nearby Starbucks. Sorry, Stephen, this is a mismatch. When the numbers do not add up, it is September 1st, 1914. Martha is dying in the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. She has long refused all suitors and though she will wind up being the wheat field with crows, of the Smithsonian collection. No alternate news can fake the fact that she is the last of her kind. When the numbers do not add up, you rage at a lost penny. You rage at odd numbers, you rage at even numbers, you rage at the suitcase of self. When numbers fail, the crows are coming toward you and the, wheat, and the field wheat is shaking out the wind even when the wind stops. Number 38, Phineas T. tags Stephen Talkhouse Farrow, the world's greatest walker. 
Steve was a great walker, a great walker among other eight-day walkers of mid-19th century renown. Yet Barnum added even more to Stephen's promotional header, last king of the Montauks, which pandered to the popular misnotion that Indians, American Indians, were a vanishing people. Long Island's Indians have long been elbowed off the table. In 1670, Daniel Denton wrote that a divine hand had removed them. On October 10th, 1910, Judge Blackmore ruled there was no Montaukit tribe subject to the protection of New York State or the federal government unless you, the plaintiffs, can prove otherwise. Poof, 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 adjourn. And uh, I have a long poem about Maxwell Wheat, but it's, it's too prosy. I never felt comfortable with it, but this part five is uh, worth reading. So I'm gonna read part five. Late fall, but not yet freezing, Max stands with his wife, Ginger. Their suburban backyard has no lawn. Instead, trees entangle for birds. And a small, freshly dug plot where Max removes his hat and reads a valedictation to cow Laura. At the parlor table, Max edits this farewell. When the pizza arrives, he lays these notes on the dog's empty chair, a 19th century chair, unadorned, handcrafted heartwood. And uh, the title of this poem is Dutz, Dutz's Farewell to Cuddy. And Dutz is a dog. Dutz is the dog part of the poem. So Dutz's Farewell to Cuddy. I never dreamed in flavors, but death smelling like a simmering steak. I left you the honey shrimp, dry food, and cans. The retiree on the Hempstead Plains. Where do you go in a prairie? The retiree reading the back of the note about the plums. Bill, garbage tonight. Peeing behind a bush, a spider on a string speeds my hurry. Peeing behind a bush, a spider on a string speeds my hurry. Old pond, old crane, big ass frog. And Geo on his tractor mower. George Wallace, that's him out riding mulching leaves, cutting grass. When he wears headsets, you know, the Yanks are playing. The retiree on political correctness, Merry Christmas. There you go. So thank you. We can go more, but uh, I think we have a, I think we have other people. Edgar, that was absolutely incredible. Bravo! Thank you so much, Edgar. Um, if everyone wants to unmute for a moment and remember to remute, we can do a big round of applause just for Edgar right now. <laughs> Yay. Yay, Grandpa! Oh, good job. Thank you. Bravo! <laughs> Bravo. Excellent. Yeah, that was awesome. And I was saying to Edgar before, George was talking, he was describing Edgar's poetry, and I was so excited for it. And Edgar was saying, Oh, I, I, uh, you're putting too much pressure. But no, it even exceeded George's wonderful <laughs> description. Amazing, Edgar. Thank you so much. So good to have you with us. Thank you. Right. And we have so many wonderful local poets. Um, and not local poets here with us tonight. There's so many, I can see them in there. So of course they're here to 
support Edgar in this event. So that's amazing to see. Hi to you all. I can't take the time, but <laughs> just mention everyone, but there's a lot of you. So that's amazing to see too. Amazing. All right, so we're gonna have our musical interlude with Linda again. I'm gonna welcome you back, Linda. I'm gonna put the spotlight on, there we go. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, have I unmuted? Yes, I mute myself. All right, well, thank you, Edgar, for, for all of your shares. And uh, I will share two tunes here. This one um, I wrote um, at the start of the uh, pandemic, and it kind of captures what I was experiencing and what I was um, witnessing, especially online. So this is called These Walls. Walls may cry like paint peeling up from the underside. Stories hidden within the cracks. What will they tell us when we look back? In the kitchen, there was singing from down the hall. Kids being kids wouldn't sit for an hour. Lights of fancy taking them to the stars. Water won't wash away my tears. Water won't wash away. One of silk and lace, one ladder torn, all the rest they taught and showed the world how hard she fought. Water won't wash away. may cry like paint filling up from the underside stories hidden within the cracks what will they tell us when we look back Thank you. I think my guitar was a little too too hot or loud, as they say. I'm gonna adjust that here. Liked it. Loved it. Thank you. I have to keep pushing a button to hear what you're saying, what I'm not saying. So, uh, thank you. And this next song, being that we're talking about um, crossing poetry with um, uh, being good stewards of the earth and landscaping and tending. Uh, uh, tending the land. Um, I hadn't
planned on doing this, but I'm going to throw this in here. Uh, my song called Pass It On Down, which speaks to all of that. And I should say that the song really was inspired by my brother-in-law, who's a poet, and I hope we'll um, read in the open. He's been here as a feature, Scudder Parker. So, Scudder, this goes out to you, especially. Now it's too loud. Okay. Is that guitar coming through okay? Thumbs up or down? Yes, that's good balance. Oh, you live a good life, you pass it on down. Hands on the wheel, your feet on the ground. Rise before sun up, work until dusk. Provide for your family, life born of love. times you have tried, many ways you have failed, to carry your stories along decades of trails, all the homes you have lived and the hills that you've sowed, you dig deep for the memories of all you have known. as always. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Beautiful. How lucky are we? We get these wonderful creative people with us who volunteer with us to share their talent. I mean, we are very lucky, honestly. I love, I love to be here. It's just been an amazing experience meeting all of you and you, Linda, back with us again. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. I feel like it's our last walking with Whitman and I'm just reminiscing about how these events have grown mm. over these uh, few months. So thank you for that. And we have more creative people coming up right now. 
we're going to uh, meet our community poets. And our first poet is Brittany Russell, who goes by Be Expressive Soul. And she's a 23-year-old international poet that sprang from the fruitful soil of Jamaica. Poetry has perpetually been one with her since childhood. She has been on multiple radio stations and poetry shows in the USA, Canada, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. She has won prizes for her poetry on open mic radio shows. She came second in the Pledge Nexus International Poetry Competition on September 1st, 2020. She's been featured in the New York Parrot Magazine for her remarkable poetry. She will be featured in the upcoming Inner Child Press anthology, Poetry, the Best of 2020. She can be found on any social media platform as Be Expressive Soul. Brittany, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna give you the spotlight. Brittany is coming to us from Jamaica and I think they had a power outage there, right, Brittany? <laughs> but you came back and I'm so glad. Gotcha. Indeed, I'm happy to be here. Okay. All right. All right. So the first poem that I'll be performing is entitled My Native Treasure. It's about my country, Jamaica. And it's my latest poem. All right. So here goes. The banana trees dance in the wind. The cheerful breeze massage to my skin. The sun smiles from a distance. Being a Jamaican is a win. Portland was the most alluring parish, but St. Vest and Westmoreland are lavish. Ocherius birthed Mystic Mountain, and Wyess Falls is the most heavenly fountain. We are hugged by the most enchanting sea. Friends, Jamaica is the place to be. Come and be kissed by our sand and explore the mystical treasures of our land. Come and hear the birds' sweet melodies and doze away in our serenity. Indulge in our scrumptious cuisines and be captured in our entrancing scenes. Come and be melted in our music and bask in the trance of our drumstick. You pray for a plate of our national dish, the mouth watering, ackee, and saltfish. Right. All right, so um, my second poem is entitled Shattered Menagerie. I know it's a hard time right now and it's a pandemic and you know, people are not really doing their usual daily activities and it may lead to depression and probably anxiety at times. So this poem goes out for people that are struggling with anxiety or depression. I just want you to know that you are enough, all right? And you're loved. It was after sunset, the smiles have faded. Everyone returned to their nest. The mirror told me that I was more broken than the rest. I am a shattered glass menagerie. My peace is drawn in my tears in the midnight when there's no one to see. The sun illuminates my darkness. The smiles returned again. I glued my pieces together and enjoyed the day with friends. But when the sun decides to hide its face and doors are shut, I heard a knock. My demons whispers, you're not enough. No, I am enough. I will not be suffocated by your bluff. Although the waves of life may be rough, I am, I am enough. Yay. So these are the two poems I wanted to perform for you guys tonight. So I hope you guys liked it. 
Awesome, Brittany. Oh my god. Very nice. Thank you so much. And I think you win the award for coming from the most distance. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. I'm so glad that you were able to connect so we could see your performance. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have uh, Samantha, can't speak, Samantha Kobler. Samantha Kobler's poems have appeared in Oddball Magazine, Mom Egg Review, Tiny Seed Journal, Rise Up Review, Hunger Mountain, and other journals and, and anthologies. She received a Ruth Stone Poetry Prize in 2010 and a Vermont Poetry Society Prize in 2014. She has her MFA from Goddard College. Originally from New Jersey, she lives in Montpelier, Vermont, where she coordinates author events for her favorite independent bookstore, Bear Pond Books, and is the poetry series editor for Rootstock Publishing. Birth of a Daughter, Kelsey Books 9120, is her first chapbook. Learn more and listen to her poems at samanthacolor.com. Oh, I see she actually disconnected, so I'm going to let her in. <laughs> Good timing. All right, Samantha. Am I still in? Just talk for one second, Samantha. And you'll... Hi, am I still in? You are. I can hear you. I just can't see you yet. One second. I'll do my video again. There you are. Okay. Hi. Last video somehow. There we go. Perfect. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Wonderful readings. Thank you, Edgar and Brittany. Linda, the songs are beautiful. Um, my mother's name was Linda. And I actually have a, a poem in my chat book where I say that my mother's name was a song. Um, I'm not going to read that poem. It's a little long, but I wanted to just say that. I thought that was neat. Um, I've been inspired to read a poem, but I have to find it, it's on my screen, because uh, Kyle here is a mathematician. And so I was inspired to read a poem I wrote about uh, math and it's called Golden Spiral. Golden Spiral. The toil of its symmetry and complicated, excuse me, the toil of its symmetry and complicated simplicity haunts me, learning it, daunting, the form and curvature of each fraction's metamorphosis into the divine, that 1.618 and so on translation of perfection, to say you are golden is just an expression of mathematics. The sacred geometry matches the birth of the seashell, the wave, unfurling of a fern in the dampening of spring, and any rectangle my eyes desire. They are all one true form of beauty, the universe handed down to us as she kissed the moon's forehead goodnight and turned on the stars, a nightlight reminder of who we are, of who we will still be when the sun awakens. Let us not forget, we did not invent ourselves a universal language, it was already here. No amount of adding or subtracting will ruin it no matter how divided we become. And then I'll, I'll read from my chat book. It just came out September 1st. It's called Birth of a Daughter. And I'll read the title poem. Birth of a Daughter. I birth myself anew as I birth you, daughter. I am me plus and minus the cells expunged to create you, daughter. You arrive, doll-sized, bright-eyed, a sponge soaking up my milk. More cells I shed to create you, feed you, daughter. Am I the mushroom, the fleshy, spore-bearing, fruiting body of a fungus? Or are you, or do we form one as a verb. Do we mushroom into this life together, daughter? I write this as you are away. We call it school, though it is June and you are three. I work, I write, I sit outside in the sun and I can't lie. It's delicious this time away from you. 
It's precious, as are you. It has only taken me 42 years to realize I am precious too. Um, I'll read another one from the chat book. This one's called, thank you. This one's called Oriola. There is a world at my fingertips or I am the world fingertipped or she is, she grips me with the tips of her fingers. She is my world or I am hers. I touch her with the tips of my fingers. She suckles the round planet that is my breast. Her fingers curl around her own palm and form a fist. She is a world grabber, world eater, and I am that world. Or I am the sun, giving life to her, the planet, the world. No, I am the world, and she, my moon and stars. She orbits around the nippled globe of me, makes visible the milk white halo. Um, I'll do one more. Most of my poems, The Birth of a Daughter chat book, thank you. It's, it's all about, um, my daughter's four, so this is all about pregnancy and motherhood. But I also have a son and I feel bad um, because I've been reading so many poems from the chat book just about my daughter. So I'll read a poem about my son. He's now 18. And this poem um, I wrote last year, it's called Sonnet for 17. Look who's crying now, look who's turning pages in the birthday book. Faces fade and morph into boy, teenager, young man. Sage is his middle name, a name written at his birth. See the picture, page two, innumerable pages away from 17, smile flashing through straight teeth, the orthodonture able to make him perfect, to think how refreshing, perfection achieved not through me, but technology. I've had help all along. Since his birth, we've been together as one. I made him, he made me, mother alone. How can I bear life without him? From greens to reds, the boy changed quick as leaves falling dead. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful and powerful, Samantha, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us from Vermont. Awesome. All right, next up we have Emily Sue Sloan. And she's joining us again, she's joined us before too. Wonderful to have you with us, Emily. And let's see, Emily Sue Sloan lives in Huntington Station, New York. Her poem, Something's Not Right, won the CAW Anthology Winter 2020 Poetry Award. Her work has appeared in Amethyst Review, Avocet, Bard's Annual, Chaos, The Poetry Vortex, Front Porch Review, Hope, The Winter 2020 CAW Anthology, Long Island Quarterly, Performance Poets Annual Literary Review, Shot Glass Journal, The Poet's Art, the Suffolk County Poetry Review, Trees in a Garden of Ashes, and the forthcoming Boston Literary Magazine Never Forgotten, 100 Poets Remember 9-11, and Corona, published by the Walt Whitman Birthplace Association, which is coming soon. Um, writing helps her to appreciate life, especially in a pandemic. All right, Emily, I'm gonna give you the spotlight. There we go. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, thanks for having me back. This has been a great evening of poetry. Thanks, Edgar. Uh, your work is quite inspiring. And thanks to the other poets. Um, I'll start with Something's Not Right. And I wrote it right as, at the start of the pandemic, just when it was uh, we were aware of it in the United States. And this was really the last time I walked outside without a mask on. Something's not right. Sunshine lights up the bay window, coaxes Christmas cactus to bloom white again, halfway to Easter. Weeping willows awaken, pale green reflected on the village pond, where mallard pears swim circles around clumsy Canada geese. 
tickle the waters where turtles sleep. My brother sends a photo of cherry blossoms starting in DC in late February. April tourists will be disappointed if anyone ventures out by then. Their hands will be chapped from constant washing. They will arm themselves with masks and hand sanitizer, uneasy at standing up to the virus that wears a crown. <clears throat> and this next one is my latest pandemic poem. Just when I thought I was done writing about this virus, uh, this one came out. It's called Rain Delay. <clears throat> Since the shelter in place order came, we've been like a ball team watching the rain from the dugout, aching to see the tarps rolled up, hear the, um, the umpire call, play ball. A two week pause has entered its fourth season. Clothing rotated in and out with the changing weather hangs on hope, slowly fraying. Library card, jewelry, cash, day-to-day -day items left out on tabletops await the all clear that won't be coming we now see for a year, maybe two. All this bonus time, nowhere to go, still I can't get organized, can't bring myself to sift through closets and drawers, to part with so many things I thought I needed. The next poem is called An Empty House. Five years old, I knew how to tell time. Even so, my mother drew me a picture, a clock with hands in position. Time to go to school. She had a doctor's appointment. I sat at the end of the couch, watched the clock, looked at the picture propped up against the lamp on the end table. Quiet filled the house, except for the rhythmic ticking and talking. Much too quickly, the clock matched the picture. Now, time to go. I imagined locking the door, walking up the hill, smelling the honeysuckle growing along the chain link fence leading to my school. The big hand continued its circular journey. A key in the lock, a whoosh of arrival. What are you doing here? Exasperation filled the room. She wrote a, a hasty note to the teacher Something about a stomach ache, I suppose. She walked me up the hill to the school, no time to smell the honeysuckle. She watched me go in. Classmates asked, why so late? Did I have an answer? Not then, not now. An empty house still keeps me tethered. And I have this one called Beaten Down. This one was inspired by a collage by Scottish artist Denise Zygadio. He's waiting for something, anything to happen. Now that there's a roof over his head and a window that looks out, even if it is on gravel and brick, nothing growing green. At least it's a place to sit and sip his bourbon neat, to hang his hat. He taped a magazine picture on the wall. The palm tree reminds him of warm breezes and places he used to visit back when he was on the road. Those were the days you could enjoy fame without getting torn up by lies, tumbling over each other in some social media cyclone. Maybe he'll spruce the place up, make it nice, like when he was somebody and could afford fancy leather shoes. And I'd like to end with this, um, I guess it's a nature poem here on Long Island. Uh, we have easy access to the beaches and forests. So a lot of my writing is inspired by all of that. Winter's late arrival. December's chill finally persuades the maple trees to release their crinkled brown leaves. Petunias, begonias, roses succumb in the waning sunlight, done in by night's first real frost. Rhododendrons pull up their gangways, tuck in for a wintry sleep. Songbirds have flown south in search of warmer treetops, but jays, cardinals, and crows jockey for position on bare branches, arguing over scant meals. Woodpeckers ratchet their way up exposed tree trunks, pounding out their ratatats. Gulls dance patterns on empty beaches. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. Wonderful, Emily Sue, as always. Thank you. I love your storytelling. It's amazing. All right. Next up, we have Eric Hafker joining us. Eric Hafker holds a BA in English and an MA in Creative Writing from Queens College, CUNY, and was a recipient of its 1990 James R. Cruiser Poetry Prize. He also studied at the Goethe Institute in Murnau, Germany. A former editor, Mr. Hafker now teaches at St. Francis Preparatory School, where he is also the faculty advisor for his literary arts journal. His book of poems, Bear, won honorable mention for the Writer's Digest 2000 Self-Published Book Award for Poetry. His work has appeared in various journals and his poem, Parchment, won Atlanta's Review 2010 International Poetry Prize. In the summers of 2013 and 2014, he was selected to attend the Southampton Writers' Conference and workshop, and workshop. His poems with Heather McHugh, Julie Sheehan, and Terrence Hayes. His second book of poems is due out this winter. Welcome, Eric. And I'm just going to look for you for a moment. I did see you. Where? I see you. There we go. <laughs> all right. Spotlight is all yours, Eric. Uh, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, George. And uh, thank you, Edgar, and my fellow poets. What a wonderful opportunity on this Friday night. Um, I'll start with uh, uh, an old poem of mine from uh, that book, Bear, and it's called Eric's Ark. It has rained for eight days and nights, and even though it's shy of Noah's incredible downpour, I build a boat in the backyard for me and my wife and watch the water level rise. First, the picnic table floats away then my neighbors asleep on their beds. Eventually, all that is visible are some TV antennas, Manhattan skyline looming in the distance like a lonely mountain range or Atlantis sinking. We paddle over to our two dachshunds and pull them off their bobbing sofa cushions, the only animal that will repopulate the world. Their descendants in Antarctica will grow white fur and bark like seals. In Africa, they will roam in packs, dragging villagers screaming from their huts. In Germany, they'll be as arrogant as poodles, knowing they're the rightful heirs to the dachshund name. Down under, they will learn how to shadow box and jump in great strides. In America, they will overindulge in food and drink lose their wiener shapes and be known as meatball dogs. <laughs> when the dove delivers the olive branch the second time and a rainbow falls across the sky, God tells us he kept his original promise. This time, he says, you did it to yourselves. Night takes over and we build a fire using pieces of the boat. We kneel in the mud and thank the Lord for sparing our lives while our dachshunds lie there basking in the glow of the fire, already looking like ancient elders from a distant time, the forgotten ancestors posing for their first portrait, the crucial Adam and Eve of the canine world. Uh, this is one of my more recent poems. Uh, it's called Opening Night. The blocking places you dramatically at the apron's edge. I'm in the darkness of the house with the others. You soliloquize beautifully. I know I'm your intended audience. The director doesn't have to know. I eagerly await your improvisations I follow you carefully like a spotlight, tracking you stage left to stage right and back again on the boards that hold you up each night with glow in the dark spike tape X's waiting on the floor for your arrival. Then you pause on one like an upside down buried treasure exposed, not under layers of tropical sand, 
but airborne. For this explorer, front row center to discover you with the map he's been holding upside down for years. I will standing ovation you while you curtain call me proudly, bowing slowly into my applause. Uh, this next one is called It's All Kosher. I want to forgive the whole world for its cruelty. I want harmony for centuries. The type of unspoken harmony the old couple next to me is sharing at Ben's on 38th. Just like them, I'll order a bowl of potato soup and the world can order the pastrami on rye with extra mustard and she'll give me half. I'll leave her most of my soup and all of the potatoes and the extra pickle and coleslaw. And she'll smile and reach for my hand, waiting for the check to arrive. <laughs> um, this next one, um, thank you to Jane Hirschfield and the Walt Whitman Birthplace. Uh, what a wonderful workshop back in uh, April of 2019. Uh, she introduced the uh, the writers at the workshop with one of her uh, pronoun poems, uh, very challenging, but um, a lot of fun and rewarding. Um, every line of the poem had to have a particular pronoun. And uh, she gave us extra time on this one, of course. And um, if my fellow poets tonight, if you have a title for me, this is uh, a year and a half later, I still can't come up with a title. It's just untitled. I wake every morning with you, curled around my neck, scarf-like. Your purring vibrates against my jugular, where retracted claws rest inches away. My wife's hand rests upon my belly. She is dreaming of the Buddha, a smile on their lips. Why can't we all trust like this, exposing our vitals? You think I don't have glimpses of them suddenly turning on me, tearing me to shreds? They know I can be a predator too. But we know we were put on this earth and this bed to be vulnerable, to be loved. And uh, my last poem is called Parchment. <clears throat> my God, this paper I'm writing on is exquisite, like cloth. You can even see the weaving. It's like writing poems on the back of my wife's linen blouse, where the pressure of my heavy words linger like carbon copy on her skin. So when she stands in the surf facing spindrift, fellow swimmers can read her back waiting for the next good wave. I'll get a seamstress to stitch my blank pages together and make me a pair of pants that breathe lightweight for summer walks along the shore to join beachcombers seeking shells white as bones. When inspiration strikes and my journal's stuck at home, I'll write stanzas on my thighs or cross my legs on a boardwalk bench and compose haiku on the inside of my calf. Maybe with two wooden sticks and a tail, I'll build a kite to write on. Imagine that, my poems a thousand feet up, metaphors snapping and straining against the wind, the sun's rays like searchlights capturing my desperate similes. Seagulls and sandpipers will know my name and appreciate me, including them in the proofreading. My scavenger poets of the atmosphere, flying hard and steady, lifting my poetry above the clouds so much blank sky we still need to fill. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. It's amazing. And we're all going to be thinking about poem titles now. And my cat actually made a special appearance, I think, just for this. And her name is actually Haiku. And I noticed she looked up when you said, <laughs> kismet right now. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, my cat is part of the audience as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> they do like to hang out. They wonder what we're doing, probably. Yeah. And I saw that your students are here as well. I saw them in the chat. 
Yes, yeah, nice. them. God bless them. My, shout out to them. Thank you, my guys and girls. Awesome. All right. So next up, we have Kim Ward. Kim Ward is a multimedia artist and the founder of the Vermont Playwright Circle. She has had poetry published in Green Mountains Review, Circumference, and Birch Song, poems centered in Vermont, volumes one and two. Her short plays have been performed around Vermont and her poetic play, Angel in the Fire, was accepted into the Last Frontier Theater Conference in 1998. All right, welcome Kim. We're getting a lot of people from Vermont, which is very exciting. We're spreading the word. Scudder is here too, Scudder Parker. I see that, yeah. Um, I was gonna say, and two of us work at Bear Pond Books, so that's. Oh yes, hold on, let me find you. I don't know, <laughs> usually brings the person speaking to the front, but tonight, yeah. I'm not doing it's not that. doing it. There you are, there's Kim. Okay, uh -huh. you can spotlight now. All right, thanks. So what a great group of poets and um, thank you so much for doing this. It's uh, in the music, it's just a great thing to be able to share anything right now um, during COVID with people is always a real blessing for me. So I was a little, I was inspired for sure um, by Edgar's repetition and variation and then uh, by the reading of a COVID poem. I've only written one poem about COVID and, and it only happened recently, so I'm gonna read it. It's called Driving During the Pandemic. My first drive during the pandemic is into a ghost town, onto a ghost highway, around an empty corner filled with crows, pecking invisible roadkill because the killing's all taking place inside the home. In the kitchen, on the stairways, over the hedge, between the clotheslines, and when a car does appear, partnering up for a cozy do -si do a sad duckling line of two, I suddenly curse and think, no, you're too close, get back. Six feet apart now, forgetting that not for car lengths, it's but for arm lengths, body lengths, body bag lengths, the lengths we must all go to survive this. And so, um, I've been writing a series of poetry poems for a long time about the German Futhark runes. There's 24 of them. And um, I'm just gonna read a couple from that series. The first one is called The Rune. I keep looking for something that will start it for everybody before I write about each rune. So that's what this is right now. The Rune. A small cave, smoke on the water, an empty longboat, once filled with settlers. The rune secrets itself inside her chest. The men gather, trumpeting for war. Hunting dogs sniff the carving knife. A dried ghost curls under her tongue, a leaf of death dislodging teeth, waiting to spring into fruition. On the end of the spear, she carves bloody handed. And so each of the others is a single stanza that I've been working on trying to mirror the Norse poetry, but also trying to connect these old images to my life here in Vermont in modern day. So the first one is Fehu. Fehu, fussy calf, short pink tongue questing. Prosperity, your cattle are huddled in the field. Feo, that fuzzy at the horn root calf. You know, if you come close to the fence, I'll offer my hand as a sloppy sacrifice just to feel your slick tongue seeking. Look upon me with your dark eyes. The fields are still wet with dew and my head is full of dreams. And so this second one, thank you. Second one is called um, Ansus. Ansus, God, mouth of time, moth of words, wisdom of the weird, Inside that hole, we part, grandmother. God takes the tongue and roots it elsewhere, lights your bones with eternal flame, sets them deep beneath my own skin. Goddess slips her tongue over your buried bones, drills the cipher to your life deeply against my hip and shin, breast and skull, and the blessings burn. And so um, what I've tried to do is then connect them to Vermont um, and this piece is called Green Mountain Runes. Great grandmother, beginning with your bare Irish feet, 
Standing on Abenaki backs, you walked from room to room. Fehu, cattle was first. Fehu, prosperity, which first generation meant sheep, more sheep than one woman could shear and not go bleary eyed and bloody handed home. The gold of the hills propped you up when you walked the rolling turf up Snipe Ireland Road, where the barns had yet to cure, much less sag. Today, I walk amidst an upturned corpse of wood and hay. The foundation is filled with rusting sides and old plows, and in the field above, the graves are full. You've moved on to Nathes, that greedy little room full of vicious joy at taking if you don't watch him. I stand before your tombstone. Below us, the highway prances like a nest of ticks. The falling dark pulls yellow fool's gold from the city on the horizon as it sparks to light. And just very last, it's a four line poem. Um, it's called Hurricane in Vermont and it got published in Birch Song the year, like six months after Irene came through, but it was actually written about my mother in the fifties. So we had had some hurricanes. Hurricane in Vermont. After the hurricane, we went out to help our neighbors in the dawn. The moon was just a sliver, sharp and small. The cows beneath the collapsed barn called out like an anguished village and were silenced with each successive blow from daddy's shotgun. Thanks. Amazing, Kim, thank you. Thank you, that imagery, wow, beautiful. All right, and so we have our last poet of the night already. These events just go by so quickly because there's just so many people involved and we're going in so many creative directions. So for our last poet, we have Kyle Singh. And Kyle Singh is an astronomy researcher at Columbia University and resides in Hicksville, New York. He has been published in several outlets and most recently had his poetry featured in Down in the Dirt magazine. All right, Kyle. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you so much everyone for having me uh, to the Whitman Association. This is my first time reading poetry, so I'm excited. And it's great to see so many people coming out to listen to some poems. I have three poems today. The first one is called Cottonmouth. At the foot of the Bial tree, the continuation of its trunk blinds you. And at the point where it begins to branch, you notice its tapering form. You find yourself in the center of the circle and become responsible for answering all of the questions. A pivot occurs when the answers are fed to you on a piece of paper and the cantor maintains his silence. I crave to live the life of a freight hopper as they sow the seeds of the rutabaga to mimic the dripping of blood on their hands. They allow iodine to course through their veins. Their cold sores become closed. On your trip, you notice the oxen. The rinds of their carcasses are crunched upon. You scavenge metal from the junkyard in pursuit to create the eighth wonder, a place to rest in and glorify the future. Telepathy was once a power you could envision with all the shallowness that would have followed. You find yourself staring into a spire. You claim to see Gutenberg there where incompleteness stamps itself and winds down the fire escape to be delivered to the masses as an inescapable theorem. The second poem is called Closed Intervals. The wilderness invents phenomena as it is subjected to information. Cogs project the edges of shadows as braided material. Deserted windows inhabiting the fog allow masks to engage in their own conception I cease to offer an olive branch and instead offer a bolt of lightning. Dissonance allows for a reprieve of wisdom and for glass to install itself as the floor. Engulf yourself in the superposition of events as they rotate into existence, envisaged by the touch of that which nobody knows. Knotted strings contrive themselves within you as intestines and as the past. Pollination comes to employ a defiance in concordance with the water cycle. Toasts are made in the face of connectedness. 
porous rays of sun come to bounce off and align over one another. Spontaneity encases itself in the shells of hermits. Curtailed bores state their despondence. And I come to know you by facing my own knowing. Cross-contamination allows for closed geometry. Parallel lines cross on the spheroid. Unavoidable consequences come from controlling initial conditions. The spawning of figures comes from the addition of graphs. Insofar as I know it, the wilderness cannot be invented. And my last poem for today is called Wicker Bowl. It's in five sections. One, you spoke about the fruit you had picked from our orchard. The weight of the ripening allowed the apricots to tumble. Most were too ripe to be savored and were wasted. When you spoke of our fruit, your focus was ethereal. It was revealing of your nurturing innards. And yet I was constantly reminded that it was your mother who had killed the saplings several times over. Two, when you installed the chimney to allow the smoke to exit, I asked you instead to allow it to enter. It would come to be a film of distortion which allowed my eyes to see. White noise stood between us and our communication it never took long for the misinterpretation to turn to silence. White walls were the standard and were painted by you frequently. The plaster on the walls seemed to dry out often. Three, terracotta pots sat on the sill, which you had learned to make in pottery school. You had potted those herbs with all of your nurturing spirit. We bickered many times on their daintiness. As time passed, my fondness for them ceased to grow. With most material objects, we come to accept them and perhaps even grow a fondness of them. But your herbs reminded me of a certain kind of asymmetry. I recognized your care for them and this disappointed me. Four, we walked with deep breaths along the seam of an arroyo where a ravine was formed by the action of water. Paralysis reached our coonhound at just the right moment. You had noticed how the other day on our over-rehearsed walk, he had led you to the wrong scent. He had lost the ability to sniff out your desires. And I finally got the chance to ask you to speak about your childhood. Five. We sat along the edge of a salt marsh. I was relieved that you had offered to prepare our dinners. I reached for the wicker bowls that were hand loomed by you many years ago. And yet this was the first time we came around to using them. As we shared open sandwiches, salt seeped through. We linked our arms and became a lump of clay. Scavengers began to pick at us. Their chicks were longing to be fed. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Amazing. Their first reading, I would never know <laughs> if you hadn't told us. Amazing. And so scientific, too. I can see that in there. All right. So we finished our poetry portion of the night. We still have some music coming up, but I want to give a big round of applause to all of our poets for tonight. If you want to unmute for a minute, go ahead. And Great job. Amazing, amazing. These are just such fun events because we hear so many different poetic voices in one night. It's incredible. Thank you everyone who joined us. Thank you to all our poets. And we're gonna hear from Linda Sussman uh, for our last uh, part of our creative night. But if you would like to come on video afterwards and say a few words or ask Edgar any questions or any of our other poets, you can definitely do that too. Um, but Linda, I'm going to give it right back to you. And I'm also going to post in the chat some links. Um, if you want to learn more about us, um, donate. We're so thankful if you're able to. Thank you. And I'm going to, I have to find Linda again, which is crazy. But I will. There you are, Linda. All right, I'm giving you the spotlight now. All right, thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Wait. 
All right, thank you, Caitlin. I got. I was. I was so engrossed um, by uh, listening that I, I forgot to grab my guitar. <laughs> so hang on one sec here. I do have it. Just repositioning. Wow. The, and and you're right, Caitlin. There are just so many different voices. Um, it's just wonderful. I loved everyone's readings, and uh, what a great night. So thank you for doing this. Thank you, Linda. And I think. Uh, all right, is that guitar coming through okay? All right. So I'm going to do one of my favorite songs of, of mine um, that I wrote um, after I, I, I'd taken a break from, um, from my music for a, a good 10 years or so, uh, caretaking for parents and just my own health issues. And so I, I got back around to it about five years ago. And um, after I recorded uh, my first album after that whole long hiatus. It was just such a high, and I'm sure that all the poets here who have um, published books and um, had their works published, I mean, you know what, what that high is like. So for a musician, I captured that in this song called The Last Mix. Is that coming through? Okay, uh, Emmy, I'm listening. <laughs> Just finished on the fall of the moon. The light was dancing through the walls in the night. The mixes were still filling my ears with sound. Oh, what a joyous night! Oh, what a joyous night! We played the same tune till it filled every pore. Hearing so many sounds till we could almost hear no more. Searching the right tone to sail away on. Oh, what a joyous night. Oh, what a joyous night. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I think I'm gonna, I have one more here to do, but I am gonna change my guitar. So um, this is the talk amongst yourselves in the chat while I do this.
I think you summed it up with what a joyous night there, Linda. <laughs> Perfect song choice. Is that distorting, Emmy? Is that too loud? Is that good? Okay, all right. I got Emmy Sue upstairs and I'm downstairs. <laughs> all right, so um, this is a fairly new tune. It's called uh, Shadows by My Side. I think it's uh, self-explanatory, so I'll just get to it. Unmute again for a big round of applause for Linda. Amazing. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. And we'll have you with us again too in the future. Thanks, Caitlin. Yes. So I want to open this up. If anyone wants to come on video um, with any questions for our poets or comments, um, again, we have so many wonderful poets here that. We know from the smaller community on Long Island and poets that we've met um, over time in our virtual events. So it's just so nice having you all together. So if anyone wants to just come on, any questions or comments, feel free. Give you a little window for time. So 
so many wonderful comments in the chat too that our poets are going to see after this event. Edgar, I have a question for Edgar. Okay. Edgar, I'm wondering about um, the combination of this, um, the visceral landscapes that you explore and the classical uh, interface because you refer to ancient Roman, ancient Greek, Egyptian, various uh, you know, obscure arcane cultural references. How, how do you, how do you, um, how do you view those two distinct bodies of material to work with? Are they harmonious? Are you looking for harmony? Are you looking for disharmony? What you're looking for? Guess um. I don't. I have a view that's scientific. I have a, a training that's scientific. <clears throat> but at the same time, I think there's something in people that's um, intrinsically tends toward art. <clears throat> so, which is symbolism relating to the world that's not necessarily scientific. So that, I mean, besides classical things, just going back further, Cave paintings, cave paintings, you know, I would consider it's just something intrinsic in human beings. Eventually, there's something in human beings that are going to make art. And art doesn't necessarily have a specific use, though it may have a spiritual, a spiritual use. So, the, you know, our initial cave paintings are spiritual. But, but to get to the classical point, I read a lot of classical books. Even in, a, in landscaping, there's classical antecedents. There's classical references all throughout uh, landscaping. Um, the uh, Greek column, you know, in three parts. The Ionic shell at the top of a, of a Greek column. You know, it's a shell. You know, it's organic. It's, uh, you know, it relates to nature. Um, the column itself may even be like a human size, like a human being. Sometimes you see that they're not just <clears throat> uh, cylinders, that they're actually creatures and things that are holding up. And, and uh, you know, the, some of the decorations on the columns were probably uh, references to uh, nature, you know, vines hanging down and, and ivy and such. And uh, even take a basket. How come all that painting's on like a terracotta urn? Because it's it's coming from like the weave of a basket, and then they're making a pot, and now that there's the next step is it's just happening, it's happening naturally. But I'm saying that there's there's this I believe that there's a spot in people that's much different than any other animal, and even our type of people, you know, like modern human beings, cro magnons, etc that we definitely, we uh, just do not live in the real world totally. There's another, you know, there's another world that, that we live in. It's just part of our nature and uh, we deny it completely. Um, it's not healthy. You know, the whole art world is uh, um, something that we need, uh, poetry being art, writing being art. Um, I think that uh, they're very compatible. They're companions. And uh, um, I've had, like I said, I've had that training. I had a lot of classical training. I read a lot of philosophers. I read uh, a lot of ancient philosophers. I mean, from the pre-Socratic, uh, you know, up until uh, 400 um, Augustine, Augustine. Um, I was a history major in college <clears throat> and uh, I particularly favored uh, Greek and Roman history, especially Greek. I, I always related uh, America to Athens and Athens had a lot of problems. Eventually they overstepped themselves. 
But and all the original poetry that comes out of there, Sappho. And uh, Plato is actually, he's writing the first uh, dialogues. You know, and dialogues comes into being. Augustine is, uh, he writes the first sort of autobiography. Um, Homer, if we go back a little bit before that real classical period, you know, I mean, if you don't read the Odyssey, it's hard to be a great poet. You have to read the Odyssey, and you have to read uh, the Iliad. Um, they're almost enough. There's almost enough in, in those two books. Um, and Rome. We go to Rome, which I, we go to Rome. That's my new view of America. It, Rome reaches a point, you know, where it just, uh, there's division, there's killing emperors every two weeks. And in Rome, the literature stops. It just gets to be a period where it just becomes garbage after a while. And uh, that creative spirit is gone. You know, hopefully in our culture here, we still have a creative spirit. And uh, I see it on Long Island. It's uh, springing up like dragon's teeth, you know, <laughs> and just, uh, and just spreading all over the place. Um, anyway, thanks for, uh, thanks for asking. <laughs> People usually don't ask me questions. It takes me too long to answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love those references. You were saying like Athens reminds you of the US. Very fascinating. Art history too. All right, anyone else want to chime in? Any questions, comments? One second. All right, well, we're gonna wrap it up. So this is our last Walking with Whitman for 2020, but we will be back with more. Um, but we will have more open mics, more poets that we feature. So that's not over, <laughs> I just wanna be clear. Um, we're gonna continue having programs. Again, we'll have that program on December 16th with the Library of Congress historian, Barbara Baer. If you wanna learn about Whitman's writing, um, see his splotchy uh, ink blots on the page. Um, but thank you so much everyone for sharing this with us. And thank you for donating. Thank you for joining. Um, all of your support just means multitudes to us, really. So thank you so much. All right. Have a wonderful night. Have a wonderful week. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, good hand for you. Thank you. <laughs> Hope to see you all soon. Stay well, everyone. Well, stay safe. And, uh, good night, everyone. Good night. God bless all you poets and and your voice. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Love listening to you. Oh my goodness, you got me very emotional. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. <laughs> what a great night. Thank you, everybody. Everybody was great, really. <laughs> yeah. We are so lucky. <laughs> I know. I, know. I can't hit the leave button. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna end. <laughs> all right, see you all. Good night. Oh, my cat's gone. Whatever that is, not me. You hear that? Yeah, everyone's muted though, George. I'm not sure. Yeah, everyone's muted. I don't know, but. I heard you, George. Is that you too, Neris? Yeah, I heard you. Do you hear music? Oh, do I hear music? No. I've got music. I heard it before, George, but. Seems to have stopped. Oh, there it goes again. I don't know. Yeah, I heard it for a split second. It might be on your computer. Ha <laughs> I found it. <laughs> well, that's never happened before, has it? <laughs> it was on my computer. Now it's actually a beat behind uh, one of Will Whitman's poems. <clears throat> All right, now back with you. All right, never mind that ever happened. Back to what we were doing. <clears throat>
I was talking about um, the support that the Women Birthplace is giving to, to local poets and connecting local poets with uh, international poets.